We saw last week um, that Paul had written a letter to the Galatians. We also seen the difference between the letter to the Galatians and all of his other letters. We had seen where Paul had thanked every other congregation or group of churches that he had sent letters to. At some point, there was always correction. None of them had it right, but there was always a thankfulness that we seen. And then we came to Galatians, and you didn't see that. And we had come to the conclusion that Paul could not thank God for the Galatians when he did not know where their spiritual status was. They had been misled. They had veered away from the true gospel, and he was angry. Not just angry to be angry, but a, a godly anger. Why are you walking away from this is what he was basically asking them. And he told them that you are changing your allegiance. Is this me making a noise or is... Okay, that might be a, a child toy. I kept hearing a rattling and I'm like, am I rattling this mic? <laughs> Sorry, I know what it is now. It won't distract me anymore. <laughs> you just keep on rattling. You're just fine. He was telling them they're changing their allegiance. And he didn't say you have completely abandoned. He said you are in the act of leaving the true gospel here. And remember, we had come to the conclusion that these people had all heard the gospel. They had believed the gospel. They were walking in the Spirit. These aren't people that just maybe heard it. Uh, there was a few that heard it. He was talking to the church, the true church, and he was saying, you're being misled. And you're just going right along with it. There's no reason for me to thank God for that, right? So he's telling them, you better wake up and remember what we taught you. If anybody comes and teaches anything different than what we came to begin with, let him be accursed. And even goes even further to say, even if an angel, not that an angel would, but even an angel comes and delivers a different message. That's how serious he was getting at. Like, you know it ain't going to happen, but even if it did, let them be accursed. And so he's telling them, there's still time at the same time. We've seen Paul's anger, but we also seen Paul's love towards these people. He didn't just leave them right where they, they were at. And that's some of, the, some of the issues that we have in the church bodies today. Not so much in this one. The Word of God is, is clearly preached here. Praise God for that. But there are some churches that, that want, want their people coming in to believe that God just wants to love you right where you're at and you're fine to just stay there. We know that is a lie. We are called to love people right where they're at, but we're not called to leave them right where they're at. The call is to holiness. And he's showing these people that, hey, you're veering off from this. Now you're going back to the law. And the law we know we could never keep. So why buy into this? You can't keep it, so the only way that you can keep it is by outwardly acting a certain way. The Pharisees had, had made their whole life wrapped around this. They knew exactly how to act. They, they would come out in, in public and prayer, these big lofty pray, uh, prayers. And everybody looked up to them. That was the most religious people. Just look how, look how they move. Look how they pray. Look how they do all these things. And yet Jesus says, y'all are all sons of the devil. So that we know that hanging on the law, there is no good there. It's just going to force you to a place where you just act. And he was letting them know that Christ plus all these things that you're wanting to do is not Christ at all. It's not Christ for salvation and then you have to have works to be saved. It's Christ alone. And He is enough. And that's what He's reminding them of. You can't walk in Christ and hang on works at the same time. Works do not save you. And we also know that works are evidence of faith. James says... Works with our faith without works is dead faith. But we are not saved by our works. It's only 
an outward expression of what we believe. That's what causes us to have works. I, I believe this, and because I believe this, I do this. So, he's telling the Galatians, you're turned into an imaginary Christ. This is not Christ at all. And in, in the main part of his letter, just to remind you again, the first part of it, which goes through a little bit better half than half of chapter 2, he's, he's dealing with his own defense. They had basically said that Paul is not an apostle. God did not call him, listen to us. And Paul is defending that. And like we said last week, what kind of sense would it make for man to give Paul the authority to be an apostle when he was the one killing the church? So this came directly from God. So Paul is making a defense for really himself. I'm telling you this because God has called me to tell you this. Listen. And then in the last half of this letter, he is given a defense of the gospel itself, which is where we're at. If left to their way of thinking, these people are going to be deceived for the rest of their life. But God is sovereign, and he, he allows Paul or prides Paul to send them a letter for correction. In chapter 5, we had seen where Paul was saying rather than trying to fill the law, he's telling them, you can fulfill the law through love. We, we heard in Sunday school this morning the same exact thing. Jesus said in, in John 13, I give you a new commandment. It wasn't a new commandment. He basically consolidated them all down into one. And then the same thing, we hear it here. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Which of the commandments are you going to break if you do that? None. None. But we also seen last week where Christian freedom is not a pass to ignore God's desire for holiness. God is still the same as he was when he first was made known, the same now. He has not changed. He still demands us to be holy. And you can't be holy by yourself. Try to hang on the law by, by itself and be holy. You can't do it. It's only through Christ's holiness. That's why it says we are hidden in Christ. We are in Christ. All we will be able to stand before God one day and say is, I'm only innocent, I'm only not guilty because of Christ. I didn't do anything. Nothing. Nothing I can ever do will save me or keep me saved. It is only by Christ. So we also seen where the purpose of this Christian freedom looks a lot like the Hebrew slave back in Exodus 21. Back in that day, slaves were required to stay six years, and that seventh year they could go free. But the example that we seen was in the seventh year when he could have went free, he said, I love my master too much. I want to stay. And we've seen the example there is kind of how we, we as Christians willingly give up our freedom. We have freedom to do whatever we want to do. You can go out and murder somebody today if you wanted to. Will you pay for your, your crime? Of course you will. But you have the ability to do that. You have the ability to just, I mean, the most heinous crimes ever. You have the ability to do it. You can walk, you got your hands, you can do all kinds of stupidity. But Christian freedom looks a lot like this Hebrew slave as we love God so much that we willingly give up our desires to sin in order to follow Him, in order to be pleasing unto Him. We're freed from sin and we want to become enslaved to God. We give that up. So we move into chapter 5. And we saw there was two desires last week. And these are still the same two desires we're going to be looking at this week. We saw there was desires of the flesh. And we saw there was, was desires, of the, or, yeah, desires of the spirit. The unsaved person, like I said last week, only has the desires of the flesh. And they don't even know that's what they have. They just live in their being. Remember to your, your days when you were not following Jesus, when you were unsaved. 
Did you think about your sin? Absolutely not. All you thought about is this is what I'm going to do today and whatever, I'm going to do it. Whoever it affects, I don't care. This is what I'm going to do. And that's how we lived our lives. It wasn't until you were shown your sin that you actually even knew that you had any. And Paul is saying the way to avoid one is to walk in the other. And we have a positive and a negative here. The positive is to avoid gratifying the desires of the flesh, walk in the Spirit. And the negative is, if you gratify the desires of the flesh, you're not walking in the Spirit. It's, it's either or. So there's a command to walk, and there's a conflict. We're still in flesh. A runner eventually tires, and we saw how many times walk is used over and over and over. And we've seen that walk was this progressive um, moving forward. This is slow and steady, but always moving forward. And I also told you last week that there was no pausing. Have you ever paused in your Christian walk and said, I'm just going to take a year off here of walking like a Christian, and the next year I'll pick it back up? It makes no sense, right? You can't do it from day to day. You will not pick up where you left off. You have set yourself backwards. Now, but if it's not about the Spirit, then guess who it's about? Me. And the more I gratify the desires of the flesh, the lesser that I want to follow the Spirit. You either walk in the Spirit or you walk in the flesh, but not both at the same time. Legalism had caused these Galatians to focus on Things outwardly. That's where the law always went. Things outwardly. They were told they had to be circumcised. They were told they had to follow these traditions. They were told follow the law. But the problem is, which ones do you follow and which ones do you don't? You either follow them all perfectly or you're cursed. We've seen that in, in another chapter in Galatians where he told them what the law does is it curses. Nobody wants to sign up for that, but that's what it says it happens. Romans 8 says that we have the indwelling uh, of the Holy Spirit. It means that victory over sin is always possible. We looked at that last week. And, there, and we also say in word is a daily seeking and dependence on the Holy Spirit. If you are a Christian, that's what we seek. We're not under the law. We're not, we're not called to act only. That acting comes out by something that's inwardly going on. And it's not by your power, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The principle, get this, the principle that formerly ruled over, over us is flesh, and that which we are called to follow now is the Spirit. The problem is the formal, former principle, the flesh, it's not taken away. You're still living in it. It operates at full strength, and when allowed, it weakens our desire to follow the Spirit. When you allow your flesh to make the decisions, you will not walk in the Spirit. Clear evidence comes from both principles, and we all know which one we're walking in by this evidence. I really want you to think about this as we're going through this list. Verses 19 through 21, we'll start here. Chapter 5, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. They can be clearly seen. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are works of unsaved people. Why is Paul saying this to saved Galatians? They've been misled, but this seems a little extreme to bring this list to the table, right? In our minds, when I read this list, our minds in this fallen state that they're in it would make me think that they don't even belong in the same conversation. This is so broad 
so broad. I mean, it goes from sexual sins of all extremities to religious extremities to jealousy. Those seem like miles apart, don't they? How do you put them on the same list? And what it comes down to is all sin is sin. Scripture is breathed out from the mouth of God, and this is absolute truth. Our mind immediately goes to where jealousy is not nearly as bad as drunken orgies. But which sin, which sin is less than the other in the eyes of God? They're all sin, right? Now, no doubt these verses, because if you just read these verses by themselves... It's probably caused so many people to doubt their salvation. Let's look at the end of verse 21 again. It says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a few on there that I can cross off real quick. But I know of people who have said that these very things other than maybe drunkenness, orgies, and sexual immorality has taken, probably taken place in church meetings. So, if they take place, immediately you go to despair. Well, I will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the ESV in the King James Version and several other translations, I believe, could have used a different word here. I read the NASB a lot. And so I went to it, and it was a different word. It was the word practice. And to just say, if you do these things, and you don't study the full doctrine of sin, this is like a bomb going off in your face. Well, why am I doing all this? Because I feel jealousy still sometimes. I feel some of these things, and I still struggle with some of these things, right? This would make, make me think that I'm just running this race in vain. There's no, there's no reason because I'm not going to inherit heaven anyway. The NASB, like I said, says who practice. And practice and do hold a little bit different weight. And this is where doctrine comes in handy. And I'm using a big word that you might not understand, but all doctrine means is what the Bible says about it, any given subject throughout the Bible. You use the Bible to interpret the Bible. And we do know that we are not without sin because, remember, if we say we have no sin, we make God to be a liar. So how do these two work together? Practice, in this sense, when you look at the original, is a present active participle of proso, which indicates an ongoing action. Thank you, Blue Letter Bible app. <laughs> if you want to go to nerdery, that's where you go, and you'll find out a whole lot about your study. Now this makes sense. These are not habitual actions, or these are habitual actions, not occasional actions. Unsaved people occasionally do good humanly things, right? And at the same time, saved people occasionally fall into sin. The basic character of unsaved people is discussed in John in 1 John Chapter 3, which says, Everyone who makes a practice, now we're using the right word, it makes more sense really to me. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. That's big. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices, whoever habitually practices righteousness is righteous. And he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Habitual sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. 
No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has not been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Hey man, thank you. So it's plain to see those who make a practice of sinning. What does that look like? I sin every day. Those who continually go back to the same sin over and over and over and over. Not because they lost the fight to it, because they love it. Do you love the sin that you keep going back to? And that's the problem. That is the problem here. Paul is not telling them that, he's not telling them this list because some of those are in this, are habitually sinning. He's telling them this list to keep them from getting to this point. These are the sins, this is what the world looks like. You have the Spirit now, walk in it so you don't look like the world. That's what he's saying. Is that not the whole message? How does the world know that we're different? We don't look like them. We don't act like them. We don't talk like them. Amen. That is how they know. And he goes on. Nor is the one who does not love his brother. We love. We love. There is something different about a Christian love and about any ordinary love. It's way, way deeper. One of the things, when I first set foot in this church, and it was years and years and years ago when it was a little bitty church in the corner, and I was lost as last year's Easter egg the whole time I attended there. But when I walked into that church, there wasn't but about 25 or 30 people in there, and the one thing that I could see more than anything was this is weird. This is weird. This is, this is hug. These people care for each other so much, and I've never seen anything like it. They loved. If they didn't do anything else right, they loved like Jesus. And I've seen the love of the pastor, and I've seen the love of the people. And then when we came back in here, after the Lord opened my eyes back in 2013, that was the first thing that I noticed had not left. It was an even bigger crowd then. And I told my wife, get ready to be hugged. Because these people hug. And she said, they do hug. Everybody, and now we're the huggers too. I mean, we hug everybody. But that's not, that's not natural to a human. Naturally, I want what I want, and I really don't care about you that much. But when the love of God comes in, now all of a sudden I'm setting myself aside. I'm just so happy to see you and I'm so, I care about your walk so much. And all I want to do is tell you how much I love you and let you know that I am there for you no matter what. And we have seen so many times, that this, we've struggled in this church. We've had heartaches, we've had loss, but we didn't separate, we didn't scatter. We loved each other. We were there. We might have been squalling just as hard as the next one, but we were there to hold each other up. And everybody's been on one side or the other of this thing. But that's the reason you keep coming back, because you know the love of God is here, and you know these people worship God. So, Paul also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, sorry, I veered off there for a minute. Or do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? It's the same thing he's saying here. Do not be deceived, uh, neither the sexual, Im sexually immoral or idolaters or adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, homosexu nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Same thing he's saying here. So now we know people who habitually sin in this way will not inherit the kingdom of God. We've connected it in two places. This is the truth. 
Paul does not say these people are habitually committing these sins. He was calling them to walk in the Spirit so that they did not occasionally commit them. Did not com uh, occasionally commit them. Nobody wakes up in the morning with the desire to walk in the Spirit and go, but, you know, there's this one sin I just really want to do today. I just got to get it off my chest. No, it's the exact opposite. I don't even want to think about these sins. I want to focus on the Spirit so that I do not commit them because if I don't walk in the Spirit, one of these is going down. It's going to happen. Maybe not to the extreme. Just because I don't walk in the Spirit don't mean I'm going to get drunk that day, but I guarantee you that some other things, fits of anger, some stuff is going to come out. Paul gives them a side-by-side -side comparison of the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Desires of the flesh are acquired by just being born. You just show up and they're there. The fruit of the Spirit comes from God alone. You will never acquire any of these things on your own. That is a way to look at yourself and go, praise God, I can see God at work in my brothers and sisters. I, they can see God at work in my own life. Because I'm going to tell you, I did not have any self-control before coming to Christ. So hot-headed, whatever was on my mind was coming out, and you were going to hear it. You could walk away, I would scream it louder. I can see evidence in my life that the Holy Spirit is working. I don't see perfection. I never will hear but the reason I get up every morning and I keep following and I keep searching Him out and keep wanting to be pleasing unto Him is because I see the evidence. It's not me in here anymore. I see the Spirit work. Amen. That's what I want more than anything. That's what a Christian should want more than anything. The law condemns the first list. Remember the works of the flesh. The mind is set on, uh, on the flesh and cannot be pleasing unto God. But when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, Paul says, against such things there is no law. You will not find any word in the Bible that condemns the production of this fruit. And if you did, if that was the case, Jesus himself would stand condemned because he possessed every one of these fruits to a level that we'll never attain here. And it's impossible to have too much of these fruits. Vance, buddy, I noticed you just got way too much self-control today. You're loving way too much. That's ridiculous, right? How can you have too much of what is good? Could you imagine the conversations if you have too much fruit of the Spirit? Absolutely not. The more we gain of the fruit, of, the fruit of the Spirit by walking in the Spirit, the more we resemble Christ. And the more we resemble Christ, the more we are being prepared for heaven. We are called to holiness, sanctification. We are called to grow in that. You can't do that by yourself. It is only through the Word of God and the work of the Spirit that this happens. Many times, if we're honest... We are guilty of feeling that this Christian walk is a burden. Be honest. A, a wrong understanding of our purpose as Christians will lead us to despair. We get caught in sin and we think we're all alone. I mean, think about it. We encounter the same hard times as the rest of the world. We all experience death. We all experience sickness. And at the same time that we experience the same, same things they are, we're walking completely against the grain of the rest of the world. It would be real easy to feel like this is a burden. This is a hard, hard walk. 
but at the same time, it is a glorious privilege. Think of your stance before salvation and answer this question here. What about me was so deserving of this great privilege to be called a child of God? The answer, nothing. Nothing. When we are reminded of this and and reminded that we all deserve to be eternally separated from the presence of God, then we see again the glorious grace of God in the mercy of God. We see this is a glorious privilege that you even get to be called a child of God, that God chose you to be His, that He adopted you when at the time that He called you, you looked just like the rest of the world. The song that we, that we sang earlier, it's probably one of my favorite ones, the, the, the part that said, Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but I know this with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. This makes no sense in my mind. Why God the Father would send His Son to die for my sins and your sins and pay our penalty, having the full wrath put on Him. Having the full wrath. It wasn't, it wasn't so much the, the pain of the beating. Yes, that was bad. And none of us will probably ever experience that level of pain for our faith. But the full wrath. Him who had no sin was made to be sin. Like he committed every one of yours and my sins was placed on him. That makes no sense to me. None of us are worth that, but God's mercy and God's love are put on full display on the cross. Now I get to inherit heaven because of nothing that I did. Just as Christ was crucified for us and now we belong to Him, look at verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Paul is not suggestion, su- suggesting, if I can speak right, that this requires total death for this to happen. You don't crucify the flesh by cutting the flesh off your bone. Romans 6.6 6. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And then again in Galatians 6.14 But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Sin is still a reality in our lives just as well it was a reality in Paul's life. But there's a clear indication there that the power of the world and our old self that used to have a stronghold on us has been broken now. We are no longer slaves to sin. Praise God. Remember, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, just like we've seen in in Romans chapter 8. That means we have the, the ability to have victory over every sin in our life. Praise God. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. John chapter 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. This is Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. 
But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Paul is saying here that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is what he is speaking of. That this, this, what it, this is what it means to live by the Spirit. So we answer the question, if we live by the Spirit, and if we are Christians, we do. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Brother Nick kept saying over and over and over again, you can tell me what you believe, but I know what you believe by what? The way you live your life. Are your actions speaking what you believe? Or your actions just te- trying to tell people what you want them to think? Is this real? That's what I kept asking you last week. Is this real to you? Because if it's just pretending, God will not be handing out Emmys for best actor. He will not. There is no purpose to keep continuing on and acting. Is it real? And if it's not real, cry out to God. Make it real for me. I don't want to pretend anymore. We can only hope that everyone that steps in this building is a child of God. But the reality of it is, is it's probably not. It's probably not. And for the unbeliever, this should be some serious stuff. You will not have inheritance in heaven. You can try to ignore it, but we all know that death is a constant reminder. It's the constant reminder that one day this life is going to end and what happens next is the big question. That's what I always folded in the back of my mind. Every time I would hear the mention of Christianity, I would just don't, I don't talk about it. Don't talk about it because that's what it led me to. What happens after we leave this world when we draw our last breath? That was the big question to me that I really didn't want to answer. I just wanted to imagine it my way, and that was it. But the Bible is clear on what happens. Those in Christ have their inheritance in heaven eternally in the presence of God, and those outside of Christ will spend eternity separated from God. Nobody can fathom the splendor of heaven. Paul said, I can't even speak about the things that I've seen. But at the same time, none of us can fathom the agony of hell for eternity. This is not a prison sentence. You don't go there for a little while. This is it. You take your last breath. If you're not in Christ, that's it. That is the warning. For the Christian, we keep walking in faith because guess what? We keep walking in the Spirit because our eternal home is with Jesus. No matter how bad it gets here, we look for the hope that is coming. Heaven is promised to us. And I'll take Paul's word for it. He couldn't even talk about it. It's got to be grand. You're in the presence of God. But to be separated from Him, my mind don't even want to go there. We can't imagine what it's going to be like. That's the warning to the unbeliever. Wake up! If you're in this room right now, wake up. I beg you, wake up. I pray to God for you to wake up. For the believer... This is also serious stuff. We are commanded to walk in the Spirit. We understand that we deserve an eternity separated from God. But because of the mercy that was shown to us, our desire should be, must be, to obey God and walk in the Spirit, which we have been commanded to do. This gives the glory to God. And that is our purpose, right? It's not about you. It's not about me, it's about God. The Christian walk is going to be full of ups and downs. But it should look like we're progressively setting ourselves aside more and more. And the more we do this, the more Christ is seen through us. The more we know, the more we know of Him, the more we desire to make Him known. 
I hope you hear this is not coming from my big loud mouth this morning. I hope you see it coming from the Word of God. This is a warning to every one of us. If you haven't been walking in the Spirit and you're a Christian, you're a true Christian. You haven't been walking in the Spirit, this is your pride back. Get back. Get back in the Word of God. Start walking in this stuff. It's not about you. It's about God. It's about giving Him glory. And if you're not a Christian, this is about you. You will not inherit the kingdom of, of God. You will not be in His presence. You will be eternally separated from Him. And I know that might not sound like a big deal. Because I can remember hearing these messages whenever I was an unbeliever. And sometimes I thought, well, that just sounds so silly. But can I tell you that every single one of us is born into this world in sin. Whether you see your sin or not, you will stand before God one day and give an account for your life. And you will have nothing, nothing to, to even hang on. I stand there by my, if I stood there by myself in front of God, it is nothing but my sin. I stand there as an enemy. It is only because of Jesus. Believing on Jesus. It is only because of Him that I will ever be able to stand before God as innocent. Because all He sees is Jesus. I'm in Him. Don't let this day go by. You are not promised tomorrow. And don't hear me trying to whip up some emotion in you either. I just want to tell you the truth. You're not promised tomorrow. And if you die in your sins, I just told you what happens. Worship group can come back up. I, I thank y'all for allowing me to speak today. I know that God's Word will never go out and not accomplish the purpose that it had for it. And so I don't, uh, I don't expect anything but just His Word. I don't, I don't need anything.